You guys are awesome and now I have to keep my promise. In a previous video I showed you this unusual flashlight. It uses no batteries, instead you squeeze the handle and a mechanism inside it generates electricity, while your hand grows a new set of muscles. I was inspired to get one after watching this video by Mr. Carlson's lab, where he demonstrated a similar flashlight made by Philips. That model turned out to be ridiculously expensive on eBay, so I got this one instead for about $20. It was made in the USSR, probably in the late 1980s, but the concept turns out to be more than a hundred years old. For example, this German Dynamo flashlight is from 1919. Mechanically, this flashlight is in good condition, but it uses an old-school incandescent light bulb. It works, but it is not as efficient as a modern LED light, so I promised if that video got 10,000 likes, I would modify the flashlight to use LEDs instead. You guys got me there in no time, while this comment aged like milk. Ok, so how do you upgrade a no battery flashlight like this one? Some of you suggested adding a small battery or a capacitor to make the light last longer. Others pointed out that I should use a full bridge rectifier. And some people said I should keep it as it is, because it's a piece of history. Fortunately, these flashlights are still around and not too expensive at second-hand marketplaces here in Bulgaria where I live. Just kidding, Bulgaria is over here. Anyway, I wouldn't feel bad about hacking one and any change that I make should be more or less reversible. This is going to be a two-part video project. In this video I'm going to show you the simplest circuit to convert this flashlight to using LEDs. And in the next video I will try using a much more sophisticated circuit that uses a supercapacitor to store energy and make the light last longer. For this project I got lots of help from my sponsor JLCPCB. JLCPCB offers a wide variety of services to bring your electronics projects to life. The company has 19 years of experience making high quality printed circuit boards at affordable prices. I've been using their PCBs for a long time for my hobby projects and I've never been disappointed. JLCPCB also offers reliable PCB assembly services, helping engineers from around the world develop their projects efficiently. Ordering these PCBs was as easy as uploading my Gerber files and parts list. I got a quote instantly and check this out, prices for PCBs start at only $2 for up to 8 layers. My PCBs were manufactured in just 24 hours, under strict quality control ensured by JLCPCB's in-house production. Do not miss JLCPCB's special offer on 6 layer PCBs. Order yours today with my link below. Now it's time to take the flashlight apart. The front bezel comes off, followed by the glass, the light bulb and the reflector. Then I have to undo 6 screws for the two halves of the body to come apart. It is clear that this flashlight was designed to be easy to service. I replaced the light bulb socket with this connector. This will make it easier to measure the output of the dynamo and test different LED circuits. Here I have the flashlight hooked up to my oscilloscope. As you can see, the output is a sine wave and the faster the mechanism spins, the higher the voltage. It goes over 10 volts peak to peak, but that is without any load. If I connect this high power resistor directly to the output, the voltage goes no higher than 4 volts peak to peak, or about 1.4 volts RMS. This is important data. Using these numbers we can calculate that the dynamo makes about 0.4 watts at most. It is no coincidence that the original light bulb inside is rated for that much power. And yes, I checked, this is the original light bulb recommended for the flashlight. So now that we have enough technical information about the dynamo, we can hook it up to an LED. Many of you commented that a bridge rectifier is required, but in some cases it is not necessary. Here is a small LED connected directly to the output and it lights up when I squeeze the handle. However, this is not an efficient circuit because the LED conducts only half the time. It is lit for only half of the wave when it is forward biased. For the other half of the wave it blocks the current because it's a diode and that is what diodes do. You can clearly see the LED flashing on and off in this slow motion video. We can improve the circuit by adding a second LED in parallel but in the reverse direction. 
now we have twice the light output because one LED is lit for every half of the sine wave. I have to point out that LEDs cannot withstand high reverse voltages. If the power and voltage were higher in my case, these would have quickly burned out. But in this case, they are safe, since the reverse voltage goes only up to 2.8 volts or so. I think all the energy produced by the dynamo goes through whichever diode is conducting, which prevents the voltage from building up any higher. But at high speed, this dynamo makes too much power for these small LEDs. So let's replace them with something bigger, like these 1 watt LEDs. And wow, this is a lot of light. A lot more than the original light bulb could ever make. This is the best simple circuit that can replace the light bulb in this flashlight with LEDs. If they are powerful enough, you do not even need series resistors, because the dynamo cannot generate enough energy to overload them. But most high quality, high power LEDs are surface mount components. That's why I made this PCB specifically for this flashlight. You are probably wondering why it has so many LEDs on it. That is simply because I wasn't sure which LEDs would work best with this flashlight. So I got several different models and broke out the contacts on this PCB to test all of them. I also 3D printed this part to which I can attach the PCB. The two fit precisely inside the flashlight, replacing the original reflector. Here are the LEDs I picked. These two are high quality OSRAM LEDs. They can easily handle more than one watt of power. These two are also made by Osram. They have a wider light beam, but are made for less power, under 0.4 watts. These four tiny SMT LEDs are for low power, but I will try running them in parallel. I got them mostly because they seemed interesting. And here I have four spots for more basic 3mm LEDs, which I can solder by hand. As a reminder, I have connected these LEDs back to back with no current limiting resistors. The low power LEDs are connected in pairs in parallel. The basic LEDs work pretty well. One advantage is that they have a narrow light beam, like a regular flashlight. The small SMD LEDs turned out to be brighter than I expected. They also perform well considering their size. But the lower power OSRAM LEDs look even brighter, at least to my eyes, even though the light spreads out a lot more. And the more powerful OSRAM LEDs didn't work. For a while I couldn't figure out why, but then I double checked the datasheet. Remember when I told you that LEDs cannot withstand high reverse voltages? Well, these turned out to be particularly sensitive. Their maximum reverse voltage is just 1.2 volts, so the AC from the dynamo destroys them instantly. That's unfortunate and unexpected, because these LEDs are technically very good. They are very powerful and have a lower forward voltage, so they should be easy to drive. That aside, all LEDs are much brighter than the original light bulb, just as you would expect. Many of you wanted to see a capacitor added to the flashlight to make the light stay on longer. Currently, this function is performed mechanically, by the flywheel. It is this metal spinning element, which stores energy thanks to its weight. A capacitor, however, can only be used to store energy if the AC from the dynamo is converted to DC. This can be done with a full wave bridge rectifier, a circuit made of four diodes in this configuration. AC goes in, DC goes out, while a capacitor keeps the voltage stable. But there are several downsides to this circuit. Here I have it built on a breadboard. These are the four diodes and this is the capacitor. First of all, the LED does not turn on instantly. The capacitor needs to charge up to a certain voltage before it can power the LED. And even when it does, the light does not really stay on for long. If I put in a bigger capacitor, it takes even longer to charge. This 1 farad supercapacitor requires about 1 minute of action before I can get any light. Secondly, some energy is lost in the diodes which is pretty bad when the dynamo doesn't make a lot of power to begin with. The higher the forward voltage of the diodes, the more energy is lost as heat. This also reduces the maximum voltage we can get at the capacitor. On top of that, it is tricky to use a capacitor as an energy storage device. This capacitor is rated for 10 volts, but I get no more than 5 volts out of the dynamo, so I cannot fill it up to its maximum potential. And if I use a supercapacitor, I have the opposite problem. 
I have to be careful not to exceed its maximum rated voltage, which for supercapacitors is relatively low. Another issue is that when the voltage of the capacitor drops too low, it cannot power the LED anymore. This supercap is almost fully charged, but it can barely keep the LED on because it doesn't have enough voltage. So, as you can see, using a capacitor with this flashlight comes with a lot of challenges and may not be a good idea. But I have a plan. I'm working on a circuit that may be able to minimize these problems. It uses very efficient diodes, two voltage converters to manage energy going in and out of the supercapacitor, and an LED driver. It is absolutely unnecessary to build a circuit this complex for a flashlight, but I think it's going to be fun to see how it performs. We'll find out in my next video. And if you're wondering why these videos take so long, well, there's the process of designing the circuit, then waiting for all the parts to arrive all the way from China. But also, I have a job and YouTube doesn't really pay a lot of money, so I can only make these videos in the very little spare time that I have. If you want to help out, simply watching, liking and sharing these videos is enough. But you can also donate directly with a thanks on YouTube. That is all I have for you today. Thanks for watching and for your patience and I'll see you in the next video.